So good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Tom Banshoff, Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our third Global Futures Lecture this semester with Dr. Jim Yong Kim, President of the World Bank Group, on the topic, A Plan for the Planet, Confronting Climate Change. Dr. Kim, thanks again for being with us here today. Now, all of us gathered here in Gaston Hall are joined by a national and global audience via webcast, including some 30 global futures bloggers at universities around the world. And I'd especially like to recognize and welcome those students joining us from Georgetown's campus in Qatar. This event is part of a semester-long conversation on the global future of development, the first of four conversations at the heart of Georgetown's new Global Futures Initiative. In the fall, we'll be turning to the global future of governance, and in 2016, we'll focus on security and the environment. Now, at the core of this initiative is an invitation to dialogue, dialogue that engages different points of view and encompasses ethical as well as practical dimensions of the global challenges we all face. In that spirit, I'll be joining Dr. Kim on stage after his lecture for questions and answers. We'll have a mic in the center aisle for those of you who are here to pose questions, and we'll also be taking questions online via Twitter at hashtag GUGlobalFutures. The index cards we distributed to you are designed for another purpose. We invite you, over the course of our time together, to write down any reactions you may have to the lecture or other thoughts on the wider topic of climate change as it relates to development. We'll be gathering the cards after the lecture and sharing your input as part of a wider conversation on the Global Futures website. It's now my pleasure to introduce President John J. DeJoya, who will introduce Dr. Kim. Under Dr. DeJoya's leadership, Georgetown has emerged as a leading global university, a community of formation, of inquiry, and of service to the global common good, an engaged global university that comes together around issues of shared concern, like the one we will be exploring today issues with an international and an ethical dimension that link back to our academic strengths and our identity as a Catholic and Jesuit institution, issues with a strong public and policy dimension of critical importance for our university, our city, our nation, and our world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Jack DeJoya. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you all for joining us this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to Gaston Hall, a place that throughout our history has provided a space for conversations important to our nation and to our world, and today is no exception. For the third time this semester, we have gathered for our lecture series in partnership with the World Bank. This sustained engagement is a reflection of our community's deep interest and understanding and contributing to concepts and solutions impacting global development. And I wish to offer my gratitude to Tom Banchoff, the Global Futures Initiative team, and the scholars and faculty leaders from across our university who have enabled us to develop this new university-wide conversation exploring ideas and action around global development. This initiative, the Global Futures Initiative, was launched in January to bring together the expertise of our community, the resources of our tradition, and our commitment to the common good to discern and to model what it means to be engaged as a global university in service to the world. This exploration takes place here in public dialogues and online fora, in our classrooms through our new Global Futures curriculum studio, and in the research activities of our faculty and students. In these many spaces, we seek to understand the various dimensions of global development through the exploration of cross-cutting themes such as religion and ethics, health and families, migration in cities, and gender and diversity. Two months ago, we inaugurated this initiative with a lecture by World Bank Group President Dr. Jim Young Kim our speaker again today. His first lecture of the World Bank lecture series was entitled Lessons from Ebola toward a post-2015 strategy for pandemic response. Last month, Dr. Koshik Basu, the World Bank's chief economist, offered the first of his lectures 
on global economic development. In the weeks since, we have been able to engage the perspectives of philosopher Martha Nussbaum, the director of the Peace Corps, Carrie hessler Radelet, and Pastor Rick Warren. We are also able to showcase the work of our graduate development programs in the School of Foreign Service and the McCourt School of Public Policy. At the end of this month, we look forward to hosting a welcoming address by Dr. Raj Shah, who recently stepped down as USAID Administrator and just weeks ago joined our community as a School of Foreign Service Distinguished Fellow. These events consider concepts, ideas, challenges, tools, and solutions that address global development. They explore the practical and ethical dimensions of development. They spur reflection and dialogue, and they seek to provide a context to develop new ideas and understandings about what global development is and what we are working towards. Today we engage Dr. Kim in another major address on an issue of urgent importance to our global community, global warming. In December of last year, in an address to the Council on Foreign Relations, Dr. King Kim described the role of the World Bank in this, in this way. He said, quote, the World Bank Group works on climate change because it is a fundamental threat to development in our lifetime. We know that if we don't confront climate change, there will be no hope of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity, close quote. Over the course of many years, the World Bank has been wrestling with this challenge, creating the climate investment funds more than six years ago. In Dr. Kim's words, quote, to pioneer investments in transformative projects for climate change and learn lessons in how to optimize climate outcomes, close quote. Just last year, the bank took another step in accounting for the climate in their work with some of the poorest nations around the world and, and developed adaptation plans for 25 countries. This work is one way that the World Bank is targeting the goals it set forth in 2013, a few months after Dr. Kim became its 12th president. These goals, ending extreme poverty by 2030 and boosting shared prosperity for the bottom 40% of our populations in developing countries. Dr. Kim is a leader in understanding the intersecting factors that affect health and the importance of linking health with human rights, human dignity, and the conditions necessary for human flourishing. A physician and anthropologist, in 1987, he co-founded Partners in Health with Paul Farmer and others, an organization that today, more than a quarter century later, is a preeminent public health organization working in poor communities on four continents. He served from 2003 to 2005 as director of the World Health Organization's HIV AIDS department, where he led the 3 by 5 initiative, the first ever global goal for AIDS treatment, which helped to expand AIDS treatment in developing countries. He co-edited Dying for Growth, Global Inequality and the Health of the Poor, and edited along with the World Health Organization, the Global Plan to Stop Tuberculosis, the first consensus business plan to address TB globally. Former president of Dartmouth College, a scholar at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, he joins us today to talk about a plan for the planet confronting climate change Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce to you the president of the World Bank Group, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, really, it's wonderful to be back here. And um, I, I want to um, uh, take you through uh, really what, where we are right now at the World Bank Group in, in terms of thinking about how to tackle climate change. You know, many of the students here um, are, are very active in battling climate change, but I want to just give you a sense of, um, of how we're thinking about it. You know, um, the, the um, so we just going to make a little adjustment here. 
We have two goals, as, uh, as President DeJoya uh, said. We, we, our goal is to end extreme poverty by 2030, and this is not going to be easy. We have uh, done a lot of projections. Uh, the Economist um, uh, uh, recently came out and said it's just impossible. It's, it's too, it's too uh, optimistic of a goal. And we've actually looked at all of uh, our projections for global growth, and we'd have to reach a very high average level of global growth over the next 15 years if we were um, uh, to reach the uh, end of uh, extreme poverty, which for us is at about 3%. We don't think it's going to be possible to get much below 3% because of uh, what, um, what the economists call frictional poverty, natural disasters, the things, a lot of which I'll talk about today, will make it extremely hard because people will be moving in and out of extreme poverty as a result of things like natural disasters. But there's no growth scenario that will automatically get us to less than 3% if the relationship between economic growth and poverty reduction stays the same. So we have to somehow change that relationship. We have to find ways of making every point of economic growth have a bigger impact on poverty. And in terms of uh, promoting shared prosperity, uh, this is the first time that the World Bank Group uh, ha has ever embraced inequality this directly. And in boosting shared prosperity, what we're talking about is the bottom 40%. Now, some of you may have heard uh, Oxfam recently, um, uh, right before the Davos meeting, uh, they put out data that were really quite striking, that the 80 wealthiest people in the world uh, control as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the people in the world. So, you know, if some people said, wow, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the richest 80 people in the world must uh, control huge amounts of wealth. It was actually 0.7% of the world's wealth, which means that the bottom half of the global population controls 0.7% of the world's wealth, and the bottom 10% are, all have negative uh, wealth. So um, uh, the situation of inequality is, uh, is extreme today. Now, uh, in fairness, there are places that have become less unequal, and then there are places that have become more unequal. But we're trying to tackle this issue directly now at the World Bank for the first time. <clears throat> Our engagement with, uh, with climate change happened in the late 1990s, after the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we began getting engaged in the technical aspects of uh, international carbon markets. Then in 2008, we put forward for the first time our comprehensive uh, strategy around climate change. And we have now grown over the years, especially in the last two and a half years. We've really accelerated uh, our work in this area. And what we really, really want to do is, is, is to try to see how we can attack this problem uh, in just about everything we do. Now, when I became uh, uh, president of the World Bank Group in, uh, in, in uh, July of 2012, I thought I had been keeping up, more or less, with what was going on in, um, in the climate change world. But I was really quite shocked at what I learned. I met with uh, um, two scientists, the eminent uh, leaders in the field, John Schnellenhuber of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and Rosina Bierbaum, who'd worked in Washington for many years, but uh, is now at the University of Michigan, and sh they showed me these two slides. So 97% of scientists agree that the planet's warming, and the consensus is as strong as ever. 2014 was the warmest year on record, and 13 of the warmest years on record happened in the last 15 years. Uh, in the last 10 years, 10% 10 of uh, the Northern Hemisphere experienced what's called the hottest hots, which is temperatures at three degrees uh, uh, of standard deviation uh, from a uh, three standard deviation, excuse me, uh, from the norm. 40 years ago, 10 years ago, 10%, 40 years ago, only 0.1% uh, of the Northern Hemisphere experienced these hottest hots. Recently, um, the extreme temperatures have approached the physiological limits of what humans and animals can withstand in being outside. Pakistan recorded a temperature recently of 129 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no um, uh, hiatus in warming. Warming seems to be continuing. And warming in the ocean surface layers has been 24 to 55%, depending on different estimates, faster than was expected by previous estimates. And the seas are now absorbing about 90% of the heat. There's really no more serious debate in, uh, in the scientific community 
about the fact of global warming and that humans are playing a part in it. Now, <clears throat> the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN body that was formed to, to, um, by, by the United Nations and also the World Meteorological Association, to come to a consensus view of global warming has recently put out this particular graph. And the, and the, top, the top part of the graph, I don't know if I have, I have the top part of the graph here the, in the black, um, this is what's going to happen if we make no change in the current emissions, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, in, 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 in the, in, in no, no, no uh, change at all. And then there are lots of other uh, scenarios. And of course, the one uh, that we, wanna, we want to aim for is right here, 1.6 degrees centimeter, but that would mean that emissions would have to peak between now and 2010. And so um, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, um, if we do nothing and the emissions keep rising as the population grows, we'll see global temperatures rise by more than 4 degrees Celsius by the 2080s. So a global mean temperature increase of 4 degrees Celsius, which is 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, approaches the difference between the temperatures today and the last ice age. Mean temperatures during the last ice age were four and a half degrees Celsius to seven degrees Celsius lower than they are today, but the shift happened over millennia. And we're talking about in a very short period of time having that kind of change in temperature. And so uh, we have argued again and again and again that, the, that, that the climate change is something we should tackle um, uh, just because we should tackle it. But it is also a critically important development issue. So our uh, a report called Turn Down the Heat that we put out in 20, the, the first of which we put out in, uh, in 2012, um, uh, showed that a four degree warmer world would mean, would mean more extreme heat waves, more intense storms and droughts. And, and you know, I'll repeat this, but it's difficult to attribute any single event to climate change. Now, there have been events attributed to climate change, and I'll talk about that later as well, but that's a very complicated calculation. And so we have to be very careful about saying, well, this is due to climate change or that's due to climate change. But uh, what we know is that there have been exceptional extreme heat waves around the world. And of course, a warmer world simply uh, predicts that more of those will happen. Uh, there have been floods in Pakistan, the strongest storm ever to hit the Philippines, um, uh, 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 Cyclone Yolanda, which is what the Philippines call it. I went and, uh, and, and visited uh, Tacloban, um, where that um, cyclone hit, and the devastation was just extraordinary. Um, the widest tornadoes ever seen in the United States, extreme droughts in Africa, Brazil, and Australia. Uh, and uh, also, um, we know that in addition to these more infrequent intense drought storms and floods, there are going to be changes in disease patterns. And uh, just, just to think about it simply, if you, um, malaria, uh, it used to be that, um, uh, that, the, that the Fenway Park area, anyone who knows uh, Boston baseball, used to be a swamp full of mosquitoes that carried malaria. The Ohio River Valley used to be a endemic for malaria, but that's moved southward. With rising temperatures, uh, it's very possible that malaria will move northwards. And diseases like lymphatic filariasis, leishmaniasis, what happens is that climate change uh, changes uh, the, uh, the uh, natural habitats of vectors of these diseases. And so will it be more severe, less severe? We don't quite know. But what we know is that the patterns of the mixing of genetic material uh, among viruses, for example, uh, is going to change. So, uh, and another um, uh, health impact is as, as extreme weather events go up, as water sources are disrupted, we can expect to see more cholera uh, outbreaks in, in areas uh, where there's lack of, of good control. The other thing that we're learning that's especially tragic is that extreme weather events hurt the poor often the most. This is Malawi, and this is just from this year. So uh, the, the darker red areas are the places with the highest poverty. And so if you look um, along uh, this area in here, that's dark. And that, that is, those are places that the number of people living in extreme poverty is 80 to 92%. So these are the extreme poor. And so the blue-gray area is, uh, is, is where the floods have hit the most. And so, uh, you know, just, just this is the rainy season now, uh, but the flooding was really unprecedented. Uh, part of the problem was that there had been droughts before and now extreme 
um, uh, rainfall and flooding. Villages were cut off. Farmland was inundated, uh, destroying the, um, the livelihoods of subsistence farmers. Last month alone, more than 600,000 people were affected. 64,000 hectares of land were flooded. And then uh, after the flooding, there was an outbreak of cholera. So we know that these extreme weather events, again, let me, let me emphasize, we're not connecting any single event. But as the frequency and intensity gets higher, we know that the poor will be affected the most. And, and in these areas, we, the World Bank, we, we, we repurposed some funding and have provided a little bit of funding, but they need more. Uh, the poor countries throughout the world are not ready for these kinds of disasters. And I'll talk more about that in just a bit. Now, uh, uh, we, is there any way, you can't see the top of it, but um, uh, if any of you have traveled around the developing world, you know that we're growing, that cities are growing, that, um, that people are building. And uh, in the next 20 years, uh, there will be more infrastructure built in the next 20 years than was built in the last 6,000 years. So we're on a building boom. And the critical thing from our perspective, because we participate in a lot of it, the critical thing from our perspective is that we've got to make the right choices now so that um, we don't have to either re retrofit and remake some of the infrastructure that we build. But there are so many good options. Um, we can choose, uh, for example, low carbon energy sources like hydroelectric, geothermal, solar, and wind. And we can choose to build smart cities and develop clean transportation. There are a lot of really good ways of doing it. We have to act now and, and, and think about how we're building every single city, for example. Think about how we're even uh, supporting um, uh, uh, farmers, because doing it now uh, is so much cheaper than doing it later. A lot of it's really common sense. Uh, for example, public transit. And we're not talking about subways in every, uh, in every nation. Bus rapid transit lines. We built the first bus rapid transit line in Africa, uh, in Nigeria. We built one in Peru. And uh, if India built 1,000 kilometers of new bus rapid transit lines, and these are specific you know, parts of the road where buses can travel, over 20 years, more than uh, 27,000 lives uh, would be saved by reducing air pollution and accidents. It would create more than 128,000 jobs, and it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 42 million tons. So there are solutions right now, but we've got to make the choices now. And this is why uh, uh, bringing these insights into everything we do, every project we fund, is so important. Now, if we're going to understand how to tackle climate change, we've got to really understand uh, the sources of, uh, of carbon, and then uh, think about what we can do uh, to tackle those sources. So there are more than 1.2 billion cars and trucks in the road. I'm sorry you can't see that, all of that. Um, uh, uh, with flights, trains, shipping, transportation makes up about 14% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we live and work in buildings that use energy, and uh, some more efficiently than others. Um, the amount of energy lost each year from old and inefficient buildings in Russia. How many people have been to Russia? Right. If any of you have been there in winter, you know what we're talking about, right? Those buildings uh, are, 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 many of them are very old, and they lose a lot of energy. So the amount of energy lost each year from old and inefficient buildings in Russia is equal to the amount of energy the country of France consumes each year. So just making headway on efficiency in buildings uh, would, would, uh, would, would be hugely impactful. So more than 80% of the energy used worldwide comes from fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels, and that's 35% of global emission. Uh, food production and livestock uh, emit greenhouse gases, as we all know. That's about 24% of total emission. And now, um, uh, with all of these different sources of emission, I'm going to play a little movie for you that gives you a sense of how uh, the temperatures have changed starting from 1818. So this is, this is global temperatures since 1818. 1880, excuse me. <clears throat> so global temperatures today are about 0 0.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial times. 90% uh, of the heat and a quarter of carbons are absorbed by the oceans. And that absorption by the oceans uh, has re resulted in a lot of damage to sea life. 
it dissolve, it's, it's already started dissolving the shells of pteropods, which are the tiny creatures that form the critically important base of the food chain. And uh, we, with, without uh, considered action, of course, we could see um, uh, as much as a two degree Celsius rise, even by the next 20 to 30 years. So just to give you a sense, so this is where we are now, but if we go from 0.8 to close to two over the next 20 to 30 years, that would mean that large parts of the city of Bangkok in Thailand would be underwater. Now, here's just a comparison of what's happened since that time. Now, the range of impacts is really enormous. Um, and you know, we, we, we want to make it clear that the impacts are different in different places. But for example, drought and heat, what droughts and heat waves in sub-Saharan Africa could leave 40% of the land now growing maize, or corn as we call it in the United States, maize, unable to support that crop. So what will happen is you'll have bouts of, uh, of uh, a famine that will occur more frequently. In the Caribbean and the southern Philippines, they could lose as much as 50% of their fish catch by 2050 because of warmer temperatures and ocean acidification. Cities across the Middle East and North Africa will see more frequent extreme heat. So in Riyadh, one in three days uh, will, um, over time, uh, be forecast to be three standard deviations above normal. So 33% of the days will be three standard deviations above normal. And uh, as all of you statisticians know, it's less than 1% if, um, uh, uh, by, by, uh, uh, based on uh, uh, normal prediction. So um, in Southeast Asia, for instance, uh, a sea level rise could reach 75 centimeters, putting several island states and low coastal areas at risk. Uh, Maldives is probably the country most at risk, and we we um, um, uh, have heard the story about um, uh, how that island might just disappear, and it might disappear relatively quickly. In Southeast Asia, a rise of just 15 centimeters, just 15 centimeters in Southeast Asia, will lead to the inundation of Bangkok that I mentioned earlier. In Latin America and the Caribbean, changing precipitation patterns will affect agricultural productivity. In Brazil, at two degrees Celsius, crop yields could decrease by 70% for soybeans and up to 50% for wheat in Brazil. In the Middle East and North Africa, a large increase in heat waves combined with warmer average temperatures will put intense pressure on already scarce <coughs> water resources. Crop yields could decrease by up to 30%. And in the Western Balkans, the high risk of drought results in the uh, potential declines for crop yields, uh, urban health, energy generation, uh, in Macedonia, uh, yield losses are projected up to 50% for maize, wheat, vegetables, and grapes at two degrees Celsius. And so it, it's something, you know, if you think two degrees Celsius is possible, the worst case scenario is in 20 to 30 years, all those things will happen potentially when you are in, well, the students who are undergraduates, when you're in your uh, 30s and 40s. And so the world has the potential of fundamentally shaping fundamentally changing by the time you're in your 30s and 40s. Now, it's not just developing countries that are facing uh, this problem. And this is um, a, a, a photo from California at Folsom Lake. Uh, in, in July of 2011, uh, on the left at 97% uh, of capacity, and uh, January 16, 2014, uh, at 17% of capacity. And so <clears throat> this is one of the instances when scientists really looked carefully at the relationship of global warming and the incidence of, these, of this combination of being both dry and hot, which California has experienced. And, and, and a Stanford study attributed the droughts, <clears throat> the, the high heat and droughts in California for the first time to climate change. In other words, through uh, complex regressions, they found out that, that if not for human-made, human-created climate change, we would not have seen the combination of dry and hot at this level. Uh, California is likely in its fourth straight year of drought. Uh, they've had six droughts in the past 20 years compared to 14 in the past 98 years. So uh, Ca California is a, um, uh, a very um, important uh, uh, economy in and of itself. And if it were a country, it would be among the 10 largest economies in the world. But, um, uh, and, and, and so just the sense, get the sense that I want to give you is that this, this state 
which would be one of the top 10 largest economies in the world, is suffering as much as it is from the drought, what must it be like for poor countries? Uh, <clears throat> the poor countries don't have Hollywood, they don't have San Francisco, they don't have all these wealthy people, they don't have the systems that California has. And so I just want to give you a sense here. So this is, this is um, the annual disaster-related loss as a percentage of the overall GDP. So Grenada, um, close to 9%. This is Vanuatu, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Many of you know that Vanuatu just suffered a horrible direct um, Category 5 hit um, uh, uh, just last week. Niue, Tongo, St. Kitts, all of these island states are, um, uh, and you know, all the way down to the, the uh, uh, Madagascar, Bangladesh, of course, a very low-lying country, uh, Nepal. And so they suffer significant percentages of their GDP of uh, damage every year because of, uh, of the, these extreme weather events. Um, over the last 30 years, uh, natural disasters took over 2.5 million lives and caused almost $4 trillion in damages. 75% of these losses were from extreme weather events. Uh, for vulnerable communities, the losses can be just absolutely devastating. In 2005, damage from Hurricane Ivan cost Grenada more than 200% of their GDP. Flooding in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina last May cost an estimated 15% of GDP in lost output and damages. And um, <clears throat> uh, uh, just last week, of course, um, Vanuatu. <clears throat> and in, uh, in, 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 in uh, w w with some uh, irony, but it was tragic irony, um, we were together, I was together with the president of Vanuatu in Sendai, of course, where the tsunami hit in Japan. And we were at a conference on disaster risk management, of all things. And uh, it was um, uh, commemorating the fourth anniversary of the, um, of the great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. And I spoke with him directly, President Lonsdale. And uh, when, I, when I sat down uh, just to introduce myself, because uh, I'd never met him, um, uh, he was very emotional. He had tears in his eyes. He didn't, he, at that moment last week, he had no idea uh, what, uh, what had happened to his country. Um, he knew that the Category of 5 hurricane had, had hit, and they're an extremely, Vanuatu is an extremely poor country. And so uh, I was extremely uh, um, uh, 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 grateful to my own team to be able to say to him that, that, that Vanuatu was part of something that's called the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Pilot, which is um, uh, an effort that, you know, so rich people in rich countries insure themselves, right? This is what we do. We, we buy insurance for all kinds of things, but poor people in poor countries have no insurance, generally speaking. So what we did was in these Pacific Island countries, we brought six of them together, and we said that while any one of you individually might have trouble getting an insurance policy post-disaster, the six of you together, we think we can do it. So we put that program together, and we're right now uh, doing the calculations uh, so that we can support Vanuatu in their uh, disaster risk response. But, you know, a Category 5 uh, um, uh, cyclone, hurricane, whatever you, you call it, coming at them right at that moment was, uh, was absolutely devastating. And we know it will continue, and we know that those storms will get more intense, and the storms will become coming more frequently. Now, one of the, one of the things that's been new for me uh, in the last year is that I've begun working with the insurance industry, especially the reinsurance industry. These are companies like Lloyd's of London, Munich Re, Swiss Re, Sumitomo in Japan. And uh, uh, what they do is they are constantly surveying the risk in the world. I talked about this uh, at my last uh, uh, presentation on, uh, on pandemics. But it's really good to talk with the insurance industry because they're constantly looking around the world at threats. And so in their survey of 30, uh, well, it was, it was it was 30,000 votes that came from indus insurance industry executives from all over the world. The number one risk is pandemics. The number two and number three risk, natural catastrophes, a confluence of major earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, flooding, and volcanic eruptions. Number three is food, water, energy crisis, a major shortfall in the supply of, of or access to food, water, energy, causing severe societal issues. These last, these, these sec the second and third, of course, are directly related to the potential impacts of climate change. And so um, uh, one of the things that we're really trying to understand is, is that in addition to building roads, in addition to 
uh, investing in health systems, invest, in addition to investing in educational systems. Can we somehow set up systems that will protect poor people from these kinds of events? Now, when Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Katrina hit, you know, the richest country on earth was not fully prepared. Uh, these, these, these storms were, were so severe that the richest country in the world itself uh, went and uh, experienced a, um, severe uh, damages with Hurricane Katrina. We, um, uh, we, we saw uh, some, I think, 1,500 people killed. Yes, 1,500 uh, people were killed. And with, um, uh, with uh, 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 Hurricane Sandy, some $50 billion in damages. And so can we set up systems that will actually help the poorest countries and the poorest people uh, protect themselves or at least recover more quickly from these kinds of events. Now, if you look at the overall um, uh, uh, spending, so de uh, development assistance, which is all the development assistance uh, you know, uh, cumulatively over a, uh, uh, between 1990 and 2009, uh, 91 per billion, or just 2% of the total, was spent on international uh, disaster financing. And of that 91.2 billion, or the 2% of total uh, development assistance, 69.9%, uh, 70% was for emergency response, 25% was for reconstruction and rehabilitation, and only 3.6% was for uh, preparedness. Now, uh, if you, it, it, probably the best prepared country in the world for disasters is Japan, and they allocate 80% of their disaster risk management budget for preparedness. So 80% is probably the right number, especially for a developed country, but we should try to, to, to invest much, much more in preparedness in developing countries. And we, in the last um, uh, 20 years or so, have spent just 3.6% of the budget. Now, we know it works. So in 2013, Cyclone, Cyclone Phelan hit India, and it killed 40 people, which was a tragedy. But a storm the same size in, in, uh, struck India in 1999, and it killed 10,000 people. So what was the difference? The Indian people were ready because there was a new early warning system that had been uh, put in place and a growing network of cyclone shelters that, that enabled 900,000 people to find safe haven from the storm. Uh, 1999, 10,000 people with a little bit of preparation. Uh, 2013, 40 people. We estimate that every dollar invested in these early warning systems uh, can provide as much as $36 in economic benefits. Now, how do you do it? So I, I, I now want to just get right into uh, what we're actually doing to try to, um, uh, to, to combat climate change. So we know that uh, right now, just the amount of um, emissions that, have been, that, 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 um, that, that we've put in the air so far, and then you add to it the emissions that are already locked in that we can't avoid, <clears throat> And we're already going to be at 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050. That's all. That's locked in. Now, um, uh, if if we're locked into 1.5, we have to start moving right now to get to net zero emissions. And so, the most important thing that we have to do is we have to decouple economic growth from carbon emissions. In other words, we have to keep the economy growing because there's just there's no turning back. I mean. The, the, but poor people throughout the world want the same things that you guys have access to. There's no turning back in terms of economic growth. So what we have to do is, is decouple growth from carbon emissions. How do you do that? Well, we have a five-point plan. And here are the five most important things. Let me just thank you. <clears throat> For us, uh, probably the most important thing we need to do is to put a price on carbon. Now, I, I, you know, we'll talk a bit more about that, but this is really important. The second is to remove fossil fuel subsidies, over $500 billion a year in fossil fuel subsidies. And I'll, uh, and I'll show you uh, some data on who fossil fuel subsidies help and hurt. Uh, we have to uh, improve energy efficiency and renewable energy use. And I'll show you a bit about how the pricing has changed. We've really got to focus on building a low carbon resilient cities. And then finally, uh, we've got to do a lot more in the area that we call climate smart agriculture. So, <clears throat> Just an overview of, uh, of um, how much fossil fuel, uh, how ma how ma how the, the size of known reserves for fossil fuels compared to uh, what we've already burned. And so um, uh, right now, in order to keep global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius, 
60 to 80 percent of oil, of coal, oil, and gas reserves of the publicly listed companies have to stay in the ground. In the next 40 years, we're likely to see policy changes that are going to require extensive retrofitting of high-emitting facilities. And a recent study by the, <clears throat> by the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis suggests that if we continue with business as usual, the world's going to build about 350 gigawatts of coal power plants that will become stranded between 2030 and 2050. Now, governments and government-controlled companies uh, uh, own about 50 to 70 percent <clears throat> of global oil, gas, and coal resources. And that means that the proceeds go right into public budgets. So this is a major issue. This is a major issue of how to keep those, uh, uh, these fossil fuels in the ground. So this, this graph just shows <clears throat> that from 20, 2000 to 2011, um, uh, 321 uh, gigatons of carbon had already been burned. And from 2000 to 2050, to stay under 2 degrees Celsius, we can only go to 886 gigatons. And this big number, uh, this, this bigger circle, is all the known fossil fuel reserves. So we're already here by 2011. We can only go to there by 2050. So uh, this is, to put it lightly, a major challenge uh, for all of us. <clears throat> now, carbon pricing. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a, relatively speaking now, <clears throat> I think, uh, um, uh, a, a, um, um, an encouraging uh, scenario. So now close to 40 countries and more than 20 cities, states, and provinces now have are preparing to implement carbon pricing. <clears throat> now, what's carbon pricing? Carbon pricing is simply uh, trying to, um, to uh, bring into our ec economic and financial system the actual cost of putting carbon in the air. We know that putting carbon into the air actually has a cost. So through taxes, through trading systems, um, there are many different ways <coughs> of putting a price on carbon. And one of the things that we're hoping for is that we can have an agreement on carbon pricing by the Paris Conference of the Parties 21, which is happening this December, uh, which is um, uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the great hope <coughs> that we all have for a post-Kyoto agreement on, uh, on uh, tackling climate change. Excuse me. <coughs> so lots of good things happening. Korea just launched the newest carbon market. China has seven pilot <coughs> carbon markets, and it plans to la launch a national emissions trading system in 2016. British Columbia has used a carbon tax uh, to reallocate its tax burden and protect the poor. Uh, and last, um, last fall, uh, we uh, prepared a statement on carbon pricing, a statement that we asked countries and companies to sign. And literally uh, a week before uh, the uh, UN General Assembly, when we were to present it, there were not that many people in countries, not that many countries and companies signing on. But then we've got a big um, surge. <clears throat> and now uh, the countries that are responsible for 54% of emissions and 52% of GDP uh, and almost half the world's population now have signed on, signed on prior to the U United Nations General Assembly meeting, uh, the high-level meeting on, uh, on climate change. And so uh, the momentum for carbon pricing is completely different this year. I was at a, a meeting in uh, Switzerland that uh, brings together all the different uh, uh, business leaders, and the business leaders, um, uh, CEOs of uh, energy companies that are among the largest emitters in the world, were coming up to me and saying, just get it done. Get the carbon pricing done, because the uncertainty is tougher for us to deal with than just having a price on carbon. And so you know, we, we don't know where this is going to go, but we're certainly encouraging uh, the setting of a price on carbon. Uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Now, many of you know that we're at very, very low um, uh, uh, oil and gas prices. Uh, we're almost 50% lower today than we were a year ago in terms of oil and gas prices. And so this is the time, this is the time to try to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. $550 billion that, uh, that, that go into fossil fuel subsidies. Um, the IMF estimates it's even more than that. And so this is the percent of GDP uh, that uh, different countries um, uh, utilize in, uh, in providing these fossil fuel subsidies. Now, there is some uh, movement. Uh, Egypt, for example, um, adopted uh, increase in the price of transport fuels, electricity, and natural gas. 
And that's going to generate $7 billion in savings. And $3 billion of the $7 billion are going to be channeled into health and education spending. This is what we want to see. Removal of these, um, uh, of the, of these fossil fuel subsidies and then the reinvestment of that money into things like health and education. Uh, India uh, liberalized diesel prices. They capped uh, propane subsidies and increased natural gas prices by 50%. Indonesia, another great story. They combined uh, the increases in the price of gasoline by 44%, diesel 22%, and electricity 15%, and then started programs to mitigate the effect of these higher energy prices on the poor through subsidized rice, free health care, cash assistance to poor students, and a one-year conditional cash transfer program that targeted poor households with pregnant, pregnant women or school-aged children. Um, Morocco was spending 5.5% of GDP on fossil fuel subsidies in 2011, and the subsidies were undercutting the country's um, uh, uh, ambitious goals for, uh, for climate change mitigation. So they did a survey, and 70% of the population didn't even know that energy subsidies existed. And so they then set up a social program to protect the poor, and then got uh, the public engaged and in agreement, and they're now uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the process of getting rid of these subsidies. And so we have our own facility. We have a $20 million facility uh, that's now working with 15 countries to design programs. And the way it should be done, and you'll, you, it'll be very clear to you why you do this, is that you, you, you by, by, by both encouraging the removal of subsidies and then putting in place programs to protect the poorest, you can have the effect that you actually want and not the effect that fossil fuel subsidies actually give you, which is that rich people gain 43%, the top 20% of earners gain 43% of the, of, the, of the value of fossil fuel subsidies and the poor, poorest, the bottom 20%, only receive 7%. The bottom 40% only receive 18% of the value. So, so fossil fuel subsidies are fundamentally regressive, not progressive. And so it doesn't make any sense. And you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who will tell you, uh, well, you really got to be careful with getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies because getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies will really help the poor. And we now have the clearest possible answer for that. Fossil fuel subsidies are not at all about protecting the poor. Uh, and so we've got to now find ways of getting rid of these subsidies, and then that will not only reduce carbon emissions, but it will, it will have the purpose of doing what, the, what governments and others actually think that they're doing, which is protecting the poor. Um, this is not uncontroversial, and it's difficult to do, because truck drivers are very good at blocking up roads and, uh, and, and, and uh, staging protests. And, and the, the, the political will to get this done is going, to, um, uh, is going to be something that, quite frankly, we just are, are going to have to find. Now, building cleaner, more livable cities uh, is also a huge um, uh, uh, task for us, but one that can also be extremely impactful. So 1950, about 30% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, it's 54% by, by 2050. 66% will live in cities, and that's 2.5 billion more residents of cities in the next uh, 35 years. Now, why do people move to cities? Well, there's not a single country in the world that's reached middle income status without a significant population shift into cities. And what are these people looking for? The same thing that everyone else is looking for, better services, good jobs, a livable environment with parks, um, uh, clean air. So uh, how we uh, build cities going forward is going to be uh, um, a critical determinant of the amount of, um, of, uh, uh, of carbon we put in the air. So uh, the potential for poverty reduction uh, is huge because 80% of GDP growth right now is generated in cities. And um, to reap the benefits, the growth has to be managed very, very well. The key, of course, is planning, land, uh, uh, planning especially for land use and basic services, and connecting with public transport systems. And then also, to enable cities to uh, independently uh, uh, get access to finance. Now, we're now doing um, uh, uh, diagnostics of 30 countries that are cover about 53% of the global urban population uh, to try to see what they're doing in, uh, and, and to see what lessons we can learn, both positive lessons and, uh, of course, uh, negative lessons. 
uh, one of the first um, uh, meetings, I, well, actually, the very first meeting I had with Premier Li Keqiang of uh, China, um, the first thing he said to me, and, and again, reflecting on the great work that had been done by my predecessor, Bob Zelik, um, Bob had, um, uh, had, had done a study with him called China 2030, which was a brilliant study and, and brilliantly executed because what, what, what they did was uh, they talked with China about the kinds of economic reforms they would need to make, which they're, which they're undergoing right now, which would change their development path. China was very reliant on investment and exports, and they wanted to change their growth model into one that was much more uh, focused on consumption and services. And so their growth would be lower, but it would be higher quality. It would set them up for the kind of growth that would take them into the next decades. And so uh, the China 2030 report was one in which they sat down together with the Chinese authorities, and the Chinese authorities made sense of these reforms in their own terms, in their own language, in their, with, their, with their own concepts. And now, of course, what you see is uh, China is very much sticking to it. So he was so happy with that study that he asked us to do a study on urbanization. Now, China's got uh, a major issues. They're going to be the first country in the world that's going to have more than a billion city dwellers. And they really wanted our help in thinking through what they were doing, but also bringing in expertise and experience like we're doing in the urbanization studies from all over the world. They wanted the best ideas in how to build clean, more livable cities and wanted us to bring them to China. China has systems, uh, the hukou system in China that uh, famously requires that um, you only get services, health, education, in the uh, place where you were born. So if you're born in a rural area and you move to a, 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 an urban area, uh, you can't get services. But now they're changing that, and it's on the basis of all the work we did with them and their own work, of course, on urbanization. So they've got reforms in land planning and urban, uh, land management, urban planning, um, mechanisms for converting rural land to urban, flexible zoning, linking transport, lots of really great stuff uh, that as soon as we finish the report, they started implementing, uh, which is, which is uh, the remarkable aspect of how, they, how, how, how they're able to move. Africa, just in the beginning part of urbanization, so we have a chance to actually get it right. So in Tanzania, uh, in, uh, in partly in support of the country's decentralization process, we're uh, increasing the ability of municipalities, of cities, to raise their own revenue, which is really, really critical. Uh, uh, Cities account now for 80%, not, not only 80% of global growth, but 80% of global emissions. So things like the bus rapid transit system uh, uh, that I talked about earlier, these are, these are critical things that we have to get right now. And uh, another, the, 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 the final thing that I think was, will, will really set these cities on a, a very, very um, um, uh, a positive path is that they really do have to have their own credit rating. They have to be able to, to raise uh, capital themselves. And we're working on that with the many of the countries right now. Renewable energy. So we um, are making a lot of effort in making financing available for renewable energy. So right here, this range here, from here to there, that's the range of current fossil fuel power costs. And so we can see that in all regions, geothermal is very much within that range. Hydroelectric power, very much within that range. <clears throat> Wind onshore is in that range. And solar, it's a little bit varied. <coughs> but this is moving very quickly. This is Central America. <laughs> the, the tallest one, the, Central, the costliest one, is Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, the red is, is Africa. And uh, this darker uh, yellow color is Asia. Now. Uh, these prices are falling very, very quickly. And our own sense is that if we are aggressive enough in making financing available, in bringing some more rationality to markets, we can bring that cost down. So we know, what we know is that these cleaner sources of energy are going to be more affordable than, than ever before. And every day, it's becoming more affordable. It's becoming even more affordable. Climate smart agriculture is another one that we, that we really want to focus on. Now, what is climate smart agriculture? Climate smart agriculture is the, just simply a way of optimizing both the productivity of, uh, of farmers and also the, the crop's ability to withstand a changing climate. So can you, in, can you produce more food that doesn't come at the expense 
of the environment while also generating higher incomes? We think the answer is yes. Can you increase farmers' resilience to these extreme weather events? We think the answer is yes. And can you lower emissions for each calorie or kilo of food produced and avoid deforestation and, um, from agriculture by taking uh, carbon out of, and, and taking carbon out of the atmosphere? So um, uh, this is what has been working in the different areas. So for example, in North America, biodigesters, fertilizer management, supply chain management, those things are part of, our, of, of the approach to, to, to more climate smart agriculture. In Latin America, livestock efficiency, agroforestry, um, uh, uh, new forms of rice, pasture management, fertilizer management. Africa, agroforestry, pasture management, uh, uh, fertilizer application. And in, in the, 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 um, the circles, uh, you know, the blue is for resilience, the, the R, this color is for productivity, and the gray is for the emissions. So uh, the great news, and this is something that Bill Gates talks about all the time, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Gates Foundation, is, as you may know, is very much into improving agriculture. The great news is that more climate-smart agriculture and more productive agriculture, especially for smallholder farmers, are the same thing. In other words, with one, you get the other. Now, how does it actually look like? So this is Costa Rica, and I'm sorry you can't see it perfectly, but this is um, uh, uh, a wonderful example of how climate smart agriculture can be um, uh, implemented in a particular farm. So he is protecting uh, the natural forest on the hillside, and the way he's done it is he's planted trees to provide both fencing and shade. The fences are trees with uh, wire strung up between them. Uh, he's preventing erosion, protecting the soil, and he's making his farm much more resilient to drought and, uh, and extreme weather by planting trees for fences. And um, he's growing high nutrient grasses for the cattle, which increases his productivity. And so in, in this particular case, he, his, he is both protecting the environment, protecting his soil, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, creating, uh, planting these trees that, of course, take carbon out of the air, and at the same time, he's increased his income. So uh, you know, th this is a wonderful example of what we think could happen if we at the World Bank Group and others push this notion uh, further. Now, what about the financing needed to, to, to fund all these new approaches, these approaches that do so many good things in addition to battling climate change? Well, global climate finance is estimated uh, to be about 700 billion to 1 trillion per year. Uh, and so uh, the, the total right now, if you add the public and the private numbers, 137 and, nine, and, uh, and, and 193, is around 330 uh, billion a year. So that's about half of what's needed. And of that 330 billion, about 34 billion flows from rich countries to poor countries. So about 10% of total financing for climate uh, change goes to the poor countries. Now. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, the developed countries, uh, the donor countries, made a promise that by 2020, they would be providing 100 billion per year to poor countries for climate change. So we're at 34 now, but we've got to get to 100. And we're very concerned uh, about finding creative ways to get to that $100 billion number, because we don't want that uh, to be the reason that we don't get an agreement in Paris at the end of this year. The agreement in Paris is so important, but, uh, but it would probably require us to get to the 100 billion. So um, uh, we're, we're getting there, and there are new uh, uh, sources of financing for climate. These are, this is the annual green bond issuance. Green bonds have gone way up. Uh, they were almost nowhere in 2007. We put together uh, the first sort of ideas about what green bonds could be, and these are simply like any other bonds, but the money that's raised from those bonds goes to climate change uh, 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 related projects. And so it's gone from almost nothing to over 36 billion, and it's gonna continue uh, to go up, and we should, uh, uh, we, we should see that, uh, that, that steep rise. Again, financing for, uh, for development. We're, uh, uh, in addition to those five major projects that we talked about, we're trying to build climate change into everything we do. Uh, we screen all our projects. Um, we track the financial commitments. We um, apply you know, an internal carbon price of, of around $30 a ton uh, to uh, our own projects. And we use greenhouse gas accounting. Now, um, 
I realize that we're at 12 o'clock, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just move through this. Um, uh, I talked a little bit about Paris. This is really, really critical. There are many things that have to happen between now and Paris. We have many important uh, meetings coming up. The, there's a financing for development conference in Addis Ababa this summer in which we'll set the stage for how we're going to fund the sustainable development goals. We had the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. We're moving to the SDGs. The sustainable development goals include climate targets. And then um, uh, we will be moving on to the Conference of the Parties, a big meeting in Paris. And when we get there, we need an agreement. And we're, we're, we're uh, absolutely laser focused on making sure that we've got a robust plan for how we're going to find the financing to get there. This is what we do. These are the five things that we do. And there's a lot of really good news. Um, first of all, as I, as I mentioned, this is your future. And uh, there's... Uh, there, there's a lot of very, very good news. We, you know, we think that growth can be decoupled. Carbon emissions were flat this year, but the economy uh, grew at close to 3%. And so is this the beginning of decoupling carbon emissions from economic growth? Boy, we sure hope so. Cities are coming up with very robust, um, uh, and countries are coming up with robust plans, and uh, companies' investors are stepping up. Apple um, uh, is going to invest $850 million in solar. Google, $300 million for residential solar power. Uh, investors are asking oil companies uh, to uh, be very clear about the risks that, um, uh, that their companies uh, are creating with, uh, with um, uh, 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 to climate change. And, you know, um, there are a lot of commitments. There's a lot of good discussion. We're moving on, on, uh, on carbon pricing. You know, there are seemingly politically difficult, but seeming no-brainers in things like fossil fuel subsidies. But I just want to let you know that, that this is the class of 2014, that it's going to be up to you. Now, you know, when I tackle climate change, I just keep thinking about my children. I've got a 14-year-old son and a 5-year-old son. And judging by the way they already talk to me, right, I can imagine in 10 or 15 years, they're going to look at me and they say, Dad, what the hell were you thinking? You were president of the World Bank. You were investing in infrastructure. How could you have left us a world like this? Right? So in 20 to 30 years, my five-year-old will be 25 or 35. Right? And so he will be in graduate school or whatever he's doing by then. Right? And he will have to live in this world potentially, where Bangkok's underwater. So I, I came here to talk about this specifically to send all of you a message. No matter what you end up doing, I mean, you can be investors, homeowners, drivers, and uh, consumers. Any, every choice you make uh, can have an impact, potentially, on this particular issue. The most important thing is to educate yourselves. Know that this is not just about um, uh, you know, going from a modern lifestyle to one in which uh, you don't take showers and you don't use energy. Right? That's just not going to happen. There are so many good ways for us to take on this epidemic. And I uh, have great hope and faith that all of you will do just that. Thank you. Please have a seat. <laughs> Oh, it's great to be back at the university. <laughs> Good. Well, we will have a, a mic set up in the center aisle. It's coming down now. And uh, there'll be opportunity for questions from the audience. And while we're waiting, um, we have gotten some things uh, through the internet, on Twitter. Here's a question from our students at uh, GUQ, at our campus, our SFS campus in Qatar. Uh, and they want to build on your last point about the role individuals can play. Um, what specifically would you say? You talked in your, your, your presentation about the World Bank, about governments. You came around to individuals at the end. Could you say a little bit more to young people about what they can do in their lives to address this issue? Well, as I said, I think that um, there, there's hardly a single profession that you can think about or a single sort of thing that you engage uh, yourself in that couldn't in some way have an impact on climate change. And so uh, that's really the important thing, that, that, that um, 
now, uh, I don't think there is um, such a thing as an education that is complete or an education that is, is full without really understanding the implications for climate change. Now, you know, having said that, um, uh, the other part of, uh, of what we do is to try to ensure that poor people have access uh, to energy. I mean, this is something that we still have to do, that you know, fossil fuels are going to be part of our future for a very long time. And um, I... Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, so uh, and, and to speak to this as well, uh, you know, this is only part of the story. Because the other part of the story that I tell all the time is that we cannot ask poor people to forego um, electricity, to forego uh, you know, access to energy uh, because the developed world has put so much carbon in the air. Right? So even though China has five times the population of the United States, it won't uh, uh, reach the United States' total um, uh, uh, carbon uh, emission until 2030. In other words, the total emissions of even China is still far lower than the United States. And so um, we have got to deal with this problem in a way that uh, takes into account all the different complexities. Right? So, so I, I, um, uh, I, I, the one thing that I want to stress is that there's no simple answer. And there's, there's, no, there's no one thing that you do that's going to solve the problem. This is a complicated, complicated, complicated issue. Uh, what, I, what, what, what we're trying to say is a price on carbon, removing fossil fuel subsidies, cleaner, more livable cities, access to finance for, for um, uh, renewable energy, more efficient buildings. These are things that are no-brainers. We can do them right now uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with not a lot of controversy, mm -hmm. and it's just crazy not to be more aggressive in taking those on. Thank you. We've got some questions from the audience, please. And please state your name and your, your question. Hi, I'm Caitlin Marr. This is Mary. Mm -hmm. And Aaron. And Aaron. Uh, We're members of GU Fossil Free. Um, we want to thank you for coming to talk about this hugely important issue. Um, and as you outlined in your talk, uh, the severity of the issue um, for developed um, prosperity for all and uh, for human life and the urgency for the global poor compels immediate action. Um, you talked about the importance of leaving fossil fuels in the ground. Um, by financially linking ourselves to the success of the fossil fuel companies, we link ourselves to the success of fossil fuels. Um, G Fossil Free, a group on campus spearheading Georgetown's investment from fossil fuels, recently met with our board of directors, um, asking them to divest from the top 200 fossil fuel companies um, in their vote in May. So if you could say anything to the board, uh, board directors, what would you say? You know, there's a lot of discussion about that going on right now, right? And so let me, let me put a little contrast from our organization and others, right? So we're also, we also have a lot of investments, and I've asked uh, our team to begin looking into our exposure as well. But the thing is, we are very exposed to fossil fuels because we're in the business of trying to create energy for poor people, right? And so, so um, uh, for, for me, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it, 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 there's not a simple answer in this. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, um, uh, having run uh, a university before and having dealt with an endowment before, uh, these are difficult things to do. And the reason they're difficult to do is because the, uh, these funds that you, that you invest in, uh, even, even if the overall exposure to fossil fuels is tiny, uh, they can be spread over many different uh, uh, funds. And so if they're spread over many different funds, a lot of those funds lock you in for a certain amount of time. And if you try to take your money out early, you take a big haircut, meaning you, you, you get less than the value of the investment. Right? And so I, I, th I think this is difficult because every leader has to weigh the, the costs and benefits. You know, if you were to completely divest from um, uh, all fossil fuel today uh, at Georgetown, the, the endowment would go down. And if the endowment goes down, then you're going to have less financing for the programs that support students. Right? And so, that's, I think that's, the, and I don't know what, your, what the portfolio is. Uh, you know, only they know what the portfolio, the, the, the board and, and others know what the portfolio is. So uh, my sense is that, um, that, that Georgetown and what President DeJoy and everyone's been doing, I tell you, I think Georgetown has a huge commitment to battling climate change. I mean, why would they have me speaking here today? And uh, I think that every uh, university has to really think hard about what it wants to do 
to send the signal that it wants to send about investments in, in, in fossil fuel companies. Now, you know, I work with fossil fuel companies very closely, right? And, uh, and you know, some of the leaders of the, uh, of the fossil fuel companies, there are major fossil fuel companies that signed on to the carbon pricing pledge, right? So uh, the good news is that the conversation's changed. And I think even in the corporate world, the conversations changed. You know, Rockefeller, the, uh, you know, they made their money uh, quite literally on putting carbon in the air. And now they're, they're divesting uh, pretty, pretty aggressively. But if you look at the activities of all the universities, there's been a lot of positive statements. But I don't think anyone has started uh, aggressively taking a haircut on a particular investment, um, you know, and, and reduced the amount of money available for student services to make this statement. I think things are moving gradually, but um, over time, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, this reality of having to leave carbon in the ground is gonna start sinking in. And uh, 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 let me put it this way. The, ch the conversation has changed more in the last year than I could have imagined. Right? It just, it's changed dramatically. And I think that what you guys have done to force the car conversation onto campuses is a very good thing, and I'm sure uh, President DeJoy would say the same thing. It's good that you're bringing this conversation to the table. I would just say, uh, don't put all your eggs in a single basket, right? I mean, it's a, it's a good thing that, that you're, you've got your eye on this, but there's so many other things that we should tackle. I mean, you know, why isn't there a, uh, why isn't there a, a, a group working on fossil fuel subsidies? That could be just as impactful. Why isn't there a group working on climate smart agriculture? These are things that, that also are gonna have a big impact. But thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Savannah Kohenke. Um, I'm a junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international econ. And um, I really like the way that you end the, the lecture with all the stuff that we can really do as kind of individuals to help with climate change. But you know, last week you had the state of Florida banning the phrase climate change from making policy. You have senators kind of bringing in snowballs as kind of an attempt to say, hey, climate change isn't happening. So there's so much that we can do as individuals, but what do we do when the people who make the policy and the people in power are kind of, many of them are so overtly against the idea that climate change is even happening? Well, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I think that the, the um uh, there's now an, um, an ex acceptance of the fact that there is climate change, right, in the U.S. Congress, but not that it's man-made, right? I think that's where we are so far. But that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a that's progression, right? We, we've, I, we're getting somewhere. Um, you know, uh, uh, for me, um, having seen just with my own eyes, you know, you, you go to Tacloban in the Philippines, and you'll never doubt that there's climate change. You know, talk to folks from the island countries. There's no doubt that climate change is real. Um, and, and, you know, go, go to Alaska, right? Uh, there's, there's no doubt that, that this stuff is happening. And so um, I like the way uh, Prime Minister Cameron says it, right? Prime Minister Cameron says it this way. He says, look, I don't really care. He says, he says I believe firmly that, that human-made climate change is real, right? And I don't really care if you believe it or not. But if there's something that might be true, Right? Why don't we just get an insurance policy in case it might be true? And that insurance policy is all the things that we talked about, all the things that we can do right now to prevent that kind of future. Right? Now, others, others uh, say things like, well, you know, uh, the mayor of London has a very interesting take on climate change. What he says is, I believe in climate change. I believe in man-made climate change. But I also believe that we don't have to go crazy about it because science will find a way of solving the problem they always have before. Right? Now, um, that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. And I would say this. I said, that very well may be true, but it will be much more likely to be true if the incentives for that kind of scientific investigation are aligned. And the way you do that is with a price on carbon. So for me, the price on carbon is so critical because if everyone all of a sudden understands that, wow, there's tons of money to be made out of taking carbon out of the air, you can bet that the forces will align. Right? So, um, those kinds of um, laws and those kinds of demonstrations, right, I, I have to say, it worries me less today than it did two and a half years ago. Because so much else is happening, right? So, so you know, um, legislators in the United States may be doing that, but the head of Standard Oil wants to talk to me about a price on carbon, right? So this is, 
the, 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 wor the world's changing around them, and uh, um, you know what you do for votes and re-election is different from um, you know what you do in a quiet room and trying to actually tackle real problems. That conversation, the quiet room and conversations in important meetings where the private sector, people like me, public sector sit down and talk about this, that's all happening. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Hi, I'm Margo Farletto. I'm a freshman studying international health. And I was wondering if you think we should be worried about um, environmental regulations like carbon pricing unfairly affecting the growth of developing countries and how to deal with that. Yeah, you know, we, we think that, that based on all the things that I've shown you, right, so uh, uh, better ways of building cities, for example, the price on carbon could put more pressure on us to do the right things in building the cities of the future that are, that are cleaner, cleaner and more livable. It will force us to pay more attention to climate smart agriculture in places like um, uh, Africa, where, you know, uh, our hopes of lifting people out of extreme poverty are going to depend on more productivity in agriculture. So, uh, I, you know, a lot of people will tell you that a price on carbon will stifle growth, right? But what I, what I just said was that, the, you know, this was a year in which carbon emissions were relatively flat. Temperatures keep going up, but carbon emissions are flat, and growth continued, right? Germany has basically decoupled their economic growth uh, from carbon emission. So there's, there's, um, there, there, there are enough options now uh, for us to, um, uh, to really get the same kind of access to energy, the same kind of uh, access to roads, access to, um, uh, uh, to clean water, health, education. We can do all these things in a much more climate smart way. And for me, what a carbon price does is it forces you down that path instead of the you know, traditional path. Hi. My name is Mark Knoll. Um, I'm a sophomore in the college studying econ and also minoring in science, technology, and international affairs with the energy concentration. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. Congratulations. That's great. <laughs> um, you said that you've talked with, like, heads of energy companies. Um, BP comes to mind. Like, they've come out in favor of carbon pricing because of the stability it brings. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had engage in like similar conversations with like ministers of countries like Russia and Nigeria in OPEC and also outside of OPEC, like Australia even, who depend very heavily on revenues from these natural resources for their budgets. And I was wondering if you could provide a sense of their attitudes towards this issue. So, um, uh, you know, on our, uh, um, uh, what, you know, the, one, of the, one of the really difficult things um, but also one of the most wonderful things about being in a multilateral institution like the UN or the World Bank is that all the conflicts in the world are right there in front of you, right, on your board. So we have a board of 25 people, but then the 25 represent all the member countries, uh, the, the, the shareholders of the World Bank Group, uh, which is about 188 now, right? And so uh, around the table at our board meetings, you see very different views, right? So some countries, are a little bit less enthusiastic about a carbon price and less enthusiastic about, uh, about um, uh, uh, car, uh, um, fossil fuel, removal of fossil fuel subsidies. There are differences in views. But um, uh, the entire board, all 25 board members and the entire uh, board of governors are extremely supportive of our efforts to combat climate change as we, as we um, uh, shape our projects. So there's been no, there's been no uh, uh, difference of opinion. And, um, uh, if you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, you know, the growth of, uh, of renewable energy in Saudi Arabia is among the highest in the world. I mean, they're, they're really moving in trying to, pro to, um, uh, to provide energy from, from, uh, from renewable sources. And, you know, um, these countries, the, the, uh, the, the so-called, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Gulf countries, they're part of all these discussions. Right? They know that, they, that their income depends on, uh, on, on the, the sale of fossil fuels, but they've also uh, been participating in, um, uh, in discussions, and Saudi Aramco has been part of, uh, uh, of, uh, of these discussions. And if I'm correct, I think I'm correct, right, Fiona? They signed on to the carbon pricing. Yeah, Saudi Aramco signed on to the carbon pricing statement. So, it's, it, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a different conversation now. I mean, it's not as polarized as it was, and I think everyone understands that these kinds of ideas, these kinds of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, changes to combat climate change are going to go forward. Now, um, 
uh, right now, the biggest concern of the, of the developing countries that uh, our oil producer is the oil prices. So they're, they're, in, they're um, uh, uh, have it going through extremely difficult times because of the drop in the oil prices. But I, I, you know, uh, in international circles, we really don't see anyone standing up and being climate change deniers. You know, there's only, there's only a few countries in the world where you have a, a, a real discussion about whether climate change exists or not. In fact, I don't know if there's any, well, any you know, uh, but like, you know, just to give an example, Norway, one of the biggest oil producers, right? And Norway is leading the charge in terms of uh, battling climate change and, uh, and, and uh, setting a price on carbon. Okay. So it's Thank changed. You. Good luck in your, what, six degrees, I heard you talk? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Dr. Kim. Um, my name is Shota Trinath. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. Um, one of the things I noticed in your slide was that 92% of the financing was going towards mitigation strategies and 8% towards adaptation. Um, given that you said that we have this significant um, temperature change already locked in for the future, does there need to be a shift towards more adaptation strategies, and how do we find that balance? Absolutely. I mean, uh, well, there has to be a, an increase in both in investments in both mitigation and adaptation. We have to do both. Um, but there's no question that we have to invest more uh, in adaptation and preparedness. And so, you know, the Sendai conference, uh, it's, been, it's been great. I mean, I, the, one, of the, one of the things I admire most about uh, Japan and the Japanese people is that after this horrific um, uh, tsunami that killed tens of thousands of people um, in, uh, near Sendai, uh, they, they turned that pain, they turned that, that tragedy into uh, this huge commitment on disaster risk management. So Prime Minister Abe just um, announced four billion new dollars in support for disaster risk management activities. And so, uh, you know, that's what we need. <clears throat> we need to, uh, to really find ways of financing um, uh, these adaptation activities, these preparedness activities. And we're trying to do it at the multilateral development banks we're looking at creative ways of using just our current balance sheet. You know, we, we have equity. <clears throat> we have equity sitting in our accounts, and we're, we're looking at ways of trying to use that to, to, um, to increase the amount of financing. You know, our climate investment fund that President DeJoya mentioned, uh, for every dollar that's gone into that climate investment fund, we have been able to leverage seven more dollars. And so <clears throat> at a one to seven uh, ratio, um, uh, we, we think that more funds invested in the Climate Investment Fund, and also what the really important development has been the Green Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund um, uh, has now $10 billion in it. It's based in, 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 uh, in Korea. That's a UN uh, body. And now, if they, too, can leverage their resources at, uh, at one to seven, <clears throat> we can leverage our, our, our existing uh, uh, balance sheets, then I think we can find a lot more money uh, for these kinds of activities. But um, kind of the point that I was making in the, in the, in the talk is that all of our development activities, just about everything we, have, we do, has to be focused on uh, tackling climate change, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Thanks. Please. Hi, Dr. Kim. My name is Daisy, and I'm a first-year medical student here. Um, you talked briefly about um, you know, how there are definitely health implications of global, global um, climate change, and you raised the malaria moving northward as an example. Um, I'm wondering um, what are some ways in which you think would be an effective way to engage healthcare professionals um, in a way to perhaps design like a preventative measure, as you said, um, in addition to these other financial ways of dealing with this issue? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the, um, one of the ideas that um, my colleagues at uh, Dartmouth were thinking about when I, when I left was to, to really look at the carbon footprint of healthcare, right? And I don't know that anyone's really done that, but if you look at all the plastic syringes and all these things that we throw out every time and ask questions like, you know, are these really single-use syringes? I mean, you know, but the, the things that are single-use syringes in the United States are multiple-use syringes everywhere else in the world, right? And so I think that's one thing that we can now begin to do, begin to really seriously look at the carbon footprint of, uh, of, of you know, sort of first-world healthcare and see if we can have an impact. Uh, I, I don't know anyone who's done that. So, so that's something that you could do. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't, um, you know, in terms of preparing for these different pandemics, that's, a, that's really a different issue, and, I, and, and it runs very much in line with what we're talking about in terms of preparedness. 
So, uh, you know, since I gave the talk here on Ebola, the conversation has progressed dramatically. And so now we've got a coalition of people, uh, and we're really going to put together this response. And it's a, it's a complex one. It's got a lot of different pieces to it. So in terms of preparing for various pandemics that could occur, I mean, I think we're well on that path. But I do think that, that every industry, that every um, profession has to really look hard at its own carbon footprint and see if there are ways of, uh, of, uh, of bringing it down. I mean, you know, um, um, uh, the, the obvious, you know, one obvious way of looking at it is why are these things single-use uh, um, uh, single uh, uh, um, uh, pieces of equipment? And, and especially if the same equipment that's sold as single-use in the United States is sold as multiple use in other parts of the world, which it is. Right? So um, why don't you do that? <laughs> we would all be grateful to you. Yeah. Yeah. So let me uh, ask you the last question uh, before we close. And it's about the politics of the issue. You've mentioned politics in different ways. What about the politics of a five-point plan like this? I mean, obviously, all five tracks are mutually reinforcing. But there, is there a sense in which one or two or three or more important than the others are linchpins to the strategy. Could you could you discuss I, that? You know, yeah. I th I think a price on carbon is the single most important thing, and the single most important thing that we've got to get out of uh, of the of the Paris uh, COP 21. And um, the reason is that um, so many of the things we're doing now, you've got to it takes so much effort to do it. Mm -hmm. You've got to you got to change the way people think about building cities. You got to change agricultural practices. So many things. And, and um, uh, the price on uh, uh, the fossil fuel subsidies are also really tough. I mean, leaders know that if they start getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies, people are going to be on the streets protesting, right? And political leaders generally don't like that, so they, they're going to they're be very hesitant. But um, to me, the price on carbon is so critical because then it will unleash market forces. And when you uh, when you when you can unleash market forces, uh, then the 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 movement toward tackling climate change then kind of feeds on itself. So that's the, I think that's the most important one. And that's the one that, that I think the prospects for a real price on carbon, I think that those have changed the most over the last year. Wonderful. Well, we've covered uh, a lot of ground, the background on the issue you gave us. You've helped us to look forward. Uh, we're very grateful for your, for your presence here today and helping us with this conversation. Just a couple of announcements before we break. One is that the next lecture in this series on the global future of development will be on April 7th with uh, Koshik Basu, chief economist at the World Bank, <laughs> on the topic uh, development economics, the big open questions. So look out for those announcements. We're also launching an essay contest uh, today. So we have an essay in multimedia contest, asking students around the world to imagine it's the year 2030, and we have achieved the World Bank's goal of eradicating extreme poverty around the world, uh, and to reflect on how we got to that point, what kinds of obstacles had to be overcome. <laughs> There's a flyer about that contest, and look out for more information about that as well. So in conclusion, thank you all for joining us here and around the world, and please join me in thanking Dr. Kim. Thank you.